Um, hello there, and thank you for joining us for the panel portion of this year's Aronson Family Lecture in Science and Society, featuring Dr. David Baker and sponsored by the Purdue Honors College. My name is Mark Aronson, and I graduated from Purdue in 2017 from the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering and the Honors College. It is my pleasure and honor to serve as moderator for today's discussion. Before I introduce you to our panelists, please allow me to set the scene for our conversation. Over the past year, we've seen the importance of science communication on a massive scale. Whether it's guidelines on masking, vaccine development and deployment, or public health measures to control viral spread, we have all witnessed how critical effective science communication is for our day-to-day -day lives. However, effective science communication is a non-trivial matter. Scientific topics can be complex, and in an age of unparalleled computational power and big data, increasingly so. Additionally, social media and preprint servers have given avenues for the public to have more, filt uh, more unfiltered access to primary researchers, complicating previous communication lines that went through university press offices and science journalists. Additionally, the scientific work being done in protein and bioengineering has increasing implications not only for our understanding of the world and developing new medicines, but on changing the very nature of humanity's relationship to the working universe. We're going to touch on all of these topics in our discussion today, but first, please join me in welcoming our panelists. To our panelists, after I introduce you, I would like each of you to either share your favorite protein molecule or your favorite protein-filled food, be that your favorite meat, seafood, or tofu dish. First up is Dr. Zara Tirani. Dr. Tirani is a clinical assistant professor in the Honors College and director of research workshops and symposia. Some of her previous research is in looking at public perceptions of stem cell therapy, and she currently leads a research team using the Fold It game from our featured speaker, Dr. Baker's lab. Dr. Tirani, welcome. And your favorite protein or protein-filled food? Thanks, Mark. Um, so my favorite protein, I think I'm going to go with um, a protein made in the, by the cell. It's called Sonic Hedgehog, just because we're talking about vid video games today. And um, this is a protein that was named after the Sega Genesis game. Um, so I'm going to pick that as my answer. All right, fantastic. Next up is Dr. Shamila Janakaraman. Shamila has a PhD from Purdue's Learning and Design Technology Program and is currently serving as a visiting faculty member. Shamila's work involves looking at using games to teach concepts in environmental sustainability. Shamila, your favorite protein or protein-filled food? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And uh, my favorite protein, I'm a vegetarian, so my main source of protein is uh, tofu, and I love Mal the Malaysian mock meat. It is soy-based but it looks and tastes like meat, but it is not meat, so I love that. Sounds delicious. <laughs> um, also here is Taryn uh, Coyle. Taryn is a senior in the microbiology program and the Honors College, who has done research both with Dr. Matu and is currently working with Dr. Tarani on the Foldit project. Taryn, welcome. And your favorite protein or protein-filled food? I would say the protein I've been thinking about the most has been the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein. Uh, but on the flip side, I really like steak, so. <laughs> All right. Um, and also joining us is Dr. Seema Matu. Dr. Matu is an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences here at Purdue. During her postdoctoral training, Dr. Matu discovered a novel family of signaling proteins called FIC proteins. And she currently runs a research group working to further understand these proteins including potential roles in Parkinson's disease. Dr. Matu, welcome. And your favorite protein or protein-filled food? Well, thank you. Um, and this is going to sound unimaginative, but I, my favorite protein is actually the one we work on, the FIC proteins. And I'll tell you why. Um, when I got started on them, they were completely unknown. In fact, they were called DUFFs or Domains of Unknown Function. And uh, we we not only figured out their function, but also their structure and kind of used some of the early platforms that came from uh, David Baker's lab. Um, and so it was also my first foray into structure biology. So that, that aspect of being first makes it very special for me. But I also like to right. like steak. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And of course, last but certainly not least, 
This year's selected speaker for the Aronson Family Science and Society Lecture Series, Dr. David Baker. Dr. Baker is the Henrietta and Aubrey Davis Endowed Professor in Biochemistry at the University of Washington, where he has adjunct appointments in genome sciences, bioengineering, chemical engineering, computer science, and physics. At UW, he serves as the Director of the Institute for Protein Design and is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Dr. Baker's lab works on understanding first principles of protein structure and function and uses this knowledge to inform computational tools to design proteins from the ground up. Dr. Baker, welcome to the Honors College at Purdue University. And what is your favorite protein or protein filled food? Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause you right there. I think we have a muted mic. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, that was my fault. Okay, and we're good. All right. Yes, yeah. we can. Welcome. Uh, so, right now, I would say my favorite protein, although it's hard to choose, it's like, um, yeah, I, I might make some of them unhappy. It's like, you know, when you have children, you have to watch questions like that. Um, uh, is a, uh, we've designed a very small 55 amino acid protein that very potently blocks um, coronavirus infection. And it's now going into clinical trials. So I'm, it's my favorite protein. I have, I have high hopes from it. And I hope that they are um, filled. Uh, yeah. All right, fantastic. Thank you all again for joining us today. Uh, one note to our audience, um, I have a number of prepared questions, but we will also be taking questions through the chat function on the YouTube live stream. So please enter your questions and they'll be forwarded to me and I will try to fold some of them into our discussion as we go. And without further ado, let's dive right in. While we often think of games as something that is used for entertainment, the form of a game can be used as an incredibly powerful learning tool. Dr. Baker's lab took advantage of this in designing Foldit. Many of us may be familiar with the central dogma, where our DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into a chain of molecules called amino acids. These amino acids then fold in a very specific way to form functional proteins. Foldit is an online game used to model the folding of proteins, which is designed both to engage the public in research regarding protein folding and to help inform ongoing work in Dr. Baker's lab. Uh, Dr. Tarani, I'd love to start with you. So tell us about your experience with Foldit. How did you come across it? And then also, uh, what made you decide to start using it as a research tool? Sure, so I first learned about Foldit through a letter from the Howard Hughes Medical um, so there was this um, article posted about how citizen scientists were using the Foldit game to um, design COVID-19 drugs. And it was during the shutdown um, sometime, I think in late March or, or early April. And um, so at that time, our faculty were looking for ways in which we could, um, you know, help our students complete their research projects because their research internships were being canceled and they couldn't go to the lab and do research um, and they were graduating this year. So we were trying to find some place-based research opportunities for students over the summer. And so when I saw this um, news article, I just thought that, you know, this is just a great um, opportunity for students to, um, you know, have some fun, play a game. Um, it's, they could do it from home. But uh, even more importantly, it's relevant to what they were, you know, it was relevant to what was going on in the world with the pandemic. So um, I proposed the project and I got a great um, response. Uh, a lot of students were interested. Um, and essentially what it is, is they, they post every couple of weeks um, some protein puzzles. So these are like proteins that were predicted to um, bind and neutralize um, the COVID-19 virus. But the, the game is where the students have to sort of um, manipulate the, the folding of the protein and figure out what's the best optimal configuration of protein. Um, and they have like a certain time period where they have to solve the puzzle by, I think they have like one week to solve the puzzle or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the students were really enthusiastic and we took off from there. Great. And then Taryn, you were one of those students that got involved with this project. So tell us a little bit about your experience. Um, what got you interested in working with Dr. Tarani on this project? Um, and what is your experience with using Folda in general? Yeah, so um, I actually, they had sent out an email to everybody describing um, the different projects that were going on. 
And I read through them and I thought that this sounded really interesting to look into. Um, so, you know, I emailed them back and was like, hey, um, I would like to be involved in this project. Um, and I actually, so I tried playing Fold It when I was in high school uh, once before. And I didn't get super far just because I didn't have that. I feel like I didn't have that background understanding that I do now. Um, and I also just, I couldn't figure it out. I don't know. I, I was in high school. Um, <laughs> but now I'm using it as part of a research project with Dr. Tehrani, as Dr. Tehrani said. Um, and I think it's been really helpful in developing a kind of spatial understanding of protein folding and like protein protein interactions. Um, I mean, you can read about like, oh, this protein goes to this receptor, but you don't really like it's hard to picture in your mind. Um, so I think it's been really useful in that. Um, and I feel like my the background knowledge that has contributed the most to this um, has been a several several sources have contributed the most to my back to my uh, understanding. Uh, and I would say that's just background knowledge on protein secondary structures, different chemical bonds that occur. Um, and then also doing a literature review um, with, um, I mean, for Dr. Tehrani um, on the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein kind of gave me some general background on everything. Um, and also the Fold It Wiki, Wiki. The Fold It Wiki was very helpful um, in understanding strategies specifically for the game to help um, create the best possible protein uh, folding that you can. Um, so yeah, I feel like the background knowledge uh, that I had really made the game much more engaging and um, useful in that sense. Great. All right, Dr. Baker, I now want to go to you. So. Um... If you don't mind, take us back to kind of the origin of Fold It. So what inspired its creation and what were the conversations going on amongst your team? Um, and what have you all learned from both developing and having people play it? Well, let's see. The genesis of this was um, many years ago. I went to the mountains with um, the father, a friend of my daughter's. Um, and uh, I like to go climbing. And, uh, uh, and we went up and I started describing uh, the the protein folding problem and uh, we had started a project called we had a project going called rosetta at home where um where people could uh where we basically would send amino acid sequences out to people all around the world and then their computers would would fold them up and actually rosetta at home is still absolutely critical to our research um so people should check it out it's um anyway when you're running rosetta at home you see the, the protein folding up on on your computer screen and uh i was describing this um uh, to my friend, and he, he was a computer scientist, and he suggested, and we then we started talking about, well, could this be turned into a game where instead of just having the computer folding up the sequence, the uh, the, the the person could could um, uh, uh, could impact that as you know could guide it, and uh, so then uh, when we got back, he introduced me uh, to um, uh, a few people in the in the CS department, and then we've been working very closely with them ever since to, um, at that point, we were just working on protein structure prediction. And so people were given amino acid sequence or folding it up. But then as our research has evolved, so have the puzzles that folded players have been working on. So now, for example, COVID uh, therapeutic binding binder design. And you mentioned the protein folding problem. So um, can you just give a second for our audience to just kind of spell out, um, it's something that sounds very simple, but is actually incredibly complicated. Um, so really, what when we think about the protein folding problem, what are we really thinking about? And the people that are playing the game, what are kind of the scientific topics that they're engaging with on that? Yeah. Um, the, uh, um, the protein folding problem is, that, so proteins carry out all the, our, the miniature machines that carry out essentially all the important functions in our bodies. They're completely uh, determined by the sequence of amino acids. So there's 20 amino acids and there each protein has a particular arrangement or sequence of them. And it's been known for 50 or 60 years that the sequence of an am the amino acid sequence of a protein um, determines what its three-dimensional structure is. But um, 
even though it's been known that they're determined that the, the sequence determines the structure, how it does so is not understood. And that's the protein folding problem. And uh, uh, folded players just try and solve the problem given a sequence of amino acids they try and fold it up into a three-dimensional structure. And the basic principle is that proteins fold to their lowest energy states. So it's, it's a search problem. You have to search through all the different arrangements of a protein chain looking for the one that has lowest energy. And that search problem is very hard. And that's with Foldit, we're trying to um, take advantage of human intuition and, and, um, and exploration, exploring capabilities to, uh, to really um, drive that search and make it better than what the computer can do alone. Yeah, I think something that really fascinates with me is there's a very kind of intuitive nature of it, this idea of folding into a specific shape. But when we actually think about all of these, um, you know, intermolecular forces that are playing out um, at this scale, um, it can the topics can be really interestingly complex, but displayed in a really beautifully simple way. Um, Shamil, I'd love to bring you in here. Um, so from your work, uh, thinking about designing games for these educational applications, um, maybe just uh, start with walking us through what are the critical components of designing a game to try to convey a certain topic or to, to help uh, someone learn a certain topic? How do you think about that? Yeah, uh, for me, you know, a game is uh, just like a book or a lesson. Like in a lesson and book, you go through several chapters or go through several sections. So game also is designed in the same way, okay? So it has different, different uh, stages or levels. So when a player plays a game and he reaches a, a certain point in the game, he is uh, given some challenges and the player has to solve those challenges and find solutions. So when he is finding solutions, there are several solutions a person can take. And uh, the biggest advantage is that it gives immediate feedback. So it tells the person who's playing whether the action taken is correct or not. And if not, they can take an alternative action. So they are able to test their solutions uh, think about different alternative solutions, so it promotes their critical thinking, and uh, it, again gives them a safe testing zone. So they are not afraid of making mistakes as well. So they can try try different solutions and then progress in the game when they find the correct solution. So that's a very important part of uh, games, and uh, also games uh, have rewards like in the form of coins or virtual gifts, which motivates them to progress further, cross a level, go to the next level, and so on. So this is very much like how a teacher will. Um, facilitate a case uh, in a class, like ask questions and uh, allow the uh, student to pass on to the next level. So the game is very much like that, but it gives immediate feedback and gives a safe testing zone and uh, learners can test their behaviors or their solutions without being afraid of making mistakes. So I think games offer an interactive dynamic uh, medium where uh, students or players can learn from their mistakes and progress further. So that is the biggest advantage of games. And uh, actually, uh, from my research, we uh, learned another thing called social learning, where the players are uh, encouraged to share their gameplay performance, uh, very much like what Aaron mentioned about the wikis, where they uh, collaborate. So by learning or exchanging their gameplay performance with others, they are actually building their learning. So that is called social learning in my uh, research. And uh, uh, one more thing is that uh, games are uh, very much connected to the present generation of the young learners. Uh, and there's a game uh, expert who calls them the digital natives. So I think games are very, very engaging platforms for our present generation. So I'm very happy about using games for, I mean, such an important study like this. Yeah, the first point that you bring up is really interesting, thinking about how that environment to kind of try and fail, rather than we think of kind of a traditional testing environment of, you know, teach, study, 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 take a test, fail or not, and then you move on, right? So very much more engaged process. Um, Dr. Baker, when your team was designing Foldit, how did you think about those tutorials? How did you think about kind of trying to uh, bring people in to that element? And those pieces that uh, Shamila touched on, uh, what kind of resonates with you when you think about Foldit and players engaging with uh, that game? Yeah, the challenge we had with Foldit is that, you know, people don't encounter proteins in their ordinary life. So they're completely foreign object, you know, they're a million times smaller than anything you can see. So we had to have, we had to develop a way for, um, for people to, to kind of build intuition. So um, uh, there's, when you start playing Foldit, there are introductory levels that you have to go through and they, they start off really, really simple. And we tried to 
we tried to make them fun. And so when you get this answer right, there's these fireworks that go off. And um, so it's a stepwise introduction to the principles of protein folding that you need to know. And a lot of work was done, um, has been done to identify where do players drop off. So as, so you go through these levels and then um, at some point, if, um, at some point, if a, if, a, if a next level is too hard, people just won't complete it. So then we could go back and try and try and make the advances in in small bites so that you could you could learn something, get a reward, learn something, get a reward. And then when it got to be too hard, just go back and split that one up. So that was one of the approaches we used. Um, Taryn, can uh, we have you come in and comment kind of about those those tutorials and again, that process, I think it's really fascinating that you um, kind of came to this game at two different points in in your educational career um, and how coming in the second time um, was really when the, a lot of the things clicked for you and those concepts. So how was working through those tutorials and um, what did you find was surprising in terms of the things you picked up easily and what were some things that maybe were more difficult um, in that? Yeah, um, so with the tutorials, I think I never made it through them my first try. And I think that was my main issue was that I tried to do puzzles without doing the tutorials. Them now that I have some background in it um, was a lot, I found it a lot easier because um, it's just, it makes more sense. Uh, you have that kind of background knowledge um, to work from. But I did, um, I definitely, I definitely understand the um, stepwise because there were a few puzzles where I got a little frustrated um, and had to take a minute um, and come back to them. And I can understand how that would uh, cause drop off at that minute. But um, I think coming back to them, it was with the background knowledge just made it a much more fulfilling experience and overall made it easier to understand and play the game. Um, Shamila, I'm gonna try to put on a devil's advocate hat here for a second and ask, um, so in this process of, of gamification, of, of using games as a learning tool, I'm wondering if we lose anything, if we, when we introduce this entertainment factor, this reward system, um, is there, do we, play a risk of having people kind of get engaged for the wrong reasons and are losing sight of the material um, for kind of the structures of the game. Yeah, a lot of research has been done on that uh, subject and there is a downside there. Like when they play the game that sometimes uh, players get too engrossed in the game uh, with the earning the rewards and things. So uh, in that process, the learning objectives may get hijacked. So that is one of the biggest worries. I so they get too much focused on the rewards and they they don't even uh, read the text prompts that appear or the visual clues that appear in the game. But I would say that is uh, entirely bad for the learning experience because I think uh, even if they're not going to see the prompts or the clues, they're going to try alternative solutions. So they might be um, actually doing discovery learning. So that uh, aligns with the constructivist learning theories where by trying out alternate solutions by discovery, uh, players are going to learn. So it could be an advantage also, but I'm not very sure uh, whether it will work the same way for everybody. So there's a great chance of them getting hijacked with the uh, rewards and the, uh, you know, the beautiful uh, structure in the games and things. It, there is a big possibility that it might happen. And then Dr. Baker, when in the process of designing it, um, I'm wondering if you and your team had to kind of, what needed to be simplified um, in terms of like topics to have the game um, be able to be picked up by anyone working through the tutorials? Like, um, did you feel like anything was lost or were there like really specific technical concepts that you feel had to absolutely stay in there um, for it to be useful in uh, solving the protein folding problem? Well, I guess the simplest uh, thing is the representation. So proteins have a protein might have 100 amino acids, but each amino acid could have, um, say, seven or eight atoms. And so, you so it's much easier to look at a system of a chain with just you know 100 steps, uh, without all the atoms, all the atom, the thousand of at, thousand or so atoms there. And so, uh, we certainly explored different representations where you see just the backbone, 
and you see then you see the side chain all the all the atoms and then uh, representations where you can sort of see the see the see the really see the the, the main chain more and have the atoms sort of be like less get in the way where um were really important and um also in terms of how you represent the various actions that you can carry out in a simple way. Um, as far as really throwing out, I'd only really had to throw out any of the key concepts because underneath underneath Foldit is, um, is this Rosetta protein modeling package that uh, we've been developing. So all the, all, the, all the deep knowledge of proteins is contained within that. So when these configurations are scored, Rosetta is used for the scoring. So um, we didn't. We were fortunate in that we didn't have to really. We could simplify the representation, but not really the scientific model. I think Dr. Matu has a question here. Yeah, I was just going to ask uh, Dr. Baker. You you mentioned that this uh, the whole concept and the whole idea kind of the game came about while you were. Um, climbing with your friend who is a, um, is a computational biologist. But you yourself also have a, a background in computer science, right? So that background, um, and suppose you were coming, coming in just as a chemist and as a protein chemist. Uh, what sort of, um, how do you envision this trajectory would have changed or um, how do you think uh, things would have been a little different or some hurdles that you might have had, um, which you were kind of in a better position to tackle because you did have this background in computer science? Um, well, let's see. So I, I have a background of a little bit uh, in a little bit of everything, but not very much of anything in particular. So in my experience, it's always good to collaborate with people who really are experts in um, in, 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 in whatever area you're trying to work on, work in. So that's just something I've always tried to do, try and try and find people who are really excited about what they're doing and are real experts and, and then work with them. Um, so, um, you know, in the context of the game, for example, this whole idea of intro levels and how you measure progress, um, it's really important how you, how you reward people for playing is very, it's very different from traditional scientific inquiry. So, just in the same way that we're now, like I said, we're trying to develop, develop you know, COVID therapeutics. You know, we're not going to do the final stages of the that. You know, there we obviously are partnering with a pharma company, but you just have to. I think it's just a general theme in, in science and really developing new things periodically. That collaborations between um, between different people with different expertise is is, is really good. So, um, so I think Rosetta at home, for example, in answer to your question. Um, we were able to do more on our own, but even there, we partnered with um, a group at Berkeley who had, who had really um, been uh, developing and pioneering uh, distributed computing uh, um, approaches. So, um, yeah, so almost nothing we do is really just done by us, I guess. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Um, I think we're now going to pivot our discussion from talking about uh, crowdsourced research and engaging the public on that um, to kind of broaden things out to a little more general discussion on public engagement with basic research uh, in general. Um, so a large portion of the research done at universities in the US is funded through grants administered by tax funded government agencies. In the biological sciences, these are commonly through either the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health. These grants work on the model that taxpayer money is funneled towards research labs that lead to breakthroughs that both advance our understanding of the universe, but also towards discoveries that circle back and benefit taxpayers themselves, either through novel medicines or other technologies. Communication of the importance of science has been highlighted as a critical factor in continued public investment into basic research. And while our current media climate has engendered a multitude of avenues through which this can occur, uh, university press offices working to highlight the work being done at their own school, while a swath of uh, the media industry from science-focused publications like Scientific American to science columns in major news outlets like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And in our age of social media, scientists themselves have avenues to communicate their work on Twitter, YouTube channels, or any number of other social media platforms. However, this blurring of roles can lead to miscommunications, as the way research is discussed and talked about among scientists uh, in one field 
may or may not translate to a general audience. Against this backdrop, I want to now open our discussion to the current state of communication of basic research and the roles and responsibilities of different parties involved. Um, so Dr. Matu, I'd love to start with you. Um, and then Dr. Baver, uh, Dr. Baker, I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, how important do you think communication of basic research to the general public is? Well, I think it's very, very important just, just by how you set it up as well. So as um, first, we have a, have a duty to the to the public because we are conducting our research using taxpayer money. So we should, just like we write progress reports for funding agencies, I think we should regularly also put out a progress report in um, general terms that the public can understand. But then the second thing is that um, if we are not communicating our science to the public, then there's a bit of a void and that void can easily be filled in with misinformation. Um, the last year, for instance, has really shown us how important it is to communicate our science in a timely manner, because as um, events are occurring, as scientific discovery is occurring, it actually has almost a real-time effect on, you know, in the case of COVID, for instance, in, ter in terms of vaccination, which vaccine are you going to get? Should you get vaccinated? Why are masks needed? All of those types of questions actually dictate um, the public's response and the public's actions. So if we don't want the wrong information to be getting out there, it's it's up to us to do a good job of presenting the primary information in a manner that's digestible to the public, that can be understood, um, and, and then implement positive change. And Dr. Baker, the same question. How important do you think the communication of basic research is to the general public? Um, well, I think it's really important. I mean, the, the general public is is paying for the research and um, and is ultimately the consumer of what comes out from the research. So, I think it's kind of obligation of scientists to uh, communicate. And um, also, it's 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 fun. Um, so, I've really enjoyed it. Like that's one of been the great things about Bullet and Rosetta at Home have been, uh, you know, the ability to to, to communicate what we're doing to a, a broader range of people and. Um, uh, yeah, so I think it's really important. Um, so Dr. Matu brought up this idea of, in addition to reports to grant agencies, um, of a report that would kind of go out to the general public on research progress. Um, what do you see as the responsibility of uh, primary research faculty like yourself in this communication process? I think it's pretty important. Um, we What we try and do is when, when papers come out that we think are of general interest, we try and um, sort of summarize what was learned in sort of a generally accessible way, and we put it on our website, um, and um, and you know sometimes try and disseminate it. Uh, so um, yeah, I, th I think it's really. I guess the main question is really what would be what's the format for um, for distributing. I think the way things work now is you know, there's all this in there. people, you generate content and then it sort of either gets picked up or doesn't get picked up by, you know, all the, you know, all the, the sort of social media stuff. So I don't know if it's, it, it perhaps could be systematized a little bit. I think the problem is that there's so much research being done that it's kind of hard. There's, there's not really any good way for, I think the general public to filter through it. So I think it's, I think, um, excuse me, I think it's, it's sort of a problem with, um, uh, just sort of magnitude of of of, of, um, of things. Um, so yeah. And then uh, bouncing back to you, Dr. Matu, uh, what do you think about the responsibilities of again primary research faculty like yourself? Um, and then this question that Dr. Baker brought up about just the the vol voluminous nature of all the work being done, um, and and how should that kind of be communicated to the the general public? Well, I, I view it as um, when you're conducting the primary research, you are the expert in that. And so you are, in many ways, the best person to be uh, disseminating that information. You know, not everyone is going to be perfect at doing that. So in that sense, use the, use the news agencies or use somebody who is an expert at communication, but make sure that you are the one presenting that literature, presenting that information. Um, so that you know, misinformation is not out there. Um, I agree there is a problem with sheer volume, but 
we can at the same time um, take ownership of our work and present it. And so, you know, use the different platforms. There are official platforms, such as our uh, university news agencies, but then you can also use your own, say, your Facebook page or your Twitter feed and make sure that your information is coming out um, to the public and that nobody else, that it's not open to misinterpretation. Um, we have a great question from the audience that I want to uh, fit in here. Uh, the question is, what have you appreciated about scientific research um, or the scientific research community being made more accessible to the public? Um, I'm guessing through these routes of uh, social media, um, or we could think talk about things like preprint servers. Um, so what have you appreciated about all of these new uh, options for accessibility? And then what, if anything, has given you pause? Um, Dr. Matu, we can start with you, and then we'll bounce back to Dr. Baker. So I, I'm, a, I'm a huge proponent of transparency and sharing information. Um, and so I've, I've liked the idea of being able to make our, our science more accessible to the public through the social media platforms um, and through preprint servers. So I'm, um, I'm a huge proponent for the preprint servers because um, in some ways it is open access science. Um, yes, there is a drawback that um, uh, since it's not always peer reviewed, a lot of bad information can also go into the preprint service servers and then used incorrectly. But I think that's where the the onus lies on that on us on our scientific community. That in some ways the preprint servers also serve as a platform where you can do um, open peer review. So if you find that something's not right or something doesn't make sense, I think it's our duty to then go and review that or put it out on that pre on that preprint and say, hey, have you thought about this or have you thought about that? Like, is, or potentially there's another interpretation. But in that sense, um, you know, the information should be out there, and then we as consumers and we as educated consumers have that responsibility to then decide how we're going to digest that information. You don't just consume everything. Um, you, you verify and see what makes sense, and, and then you evaluate what's real and what's not. And then Dr. Baker, uh, same question. What have you appreciated about all these new modes of accessibility to the scientific community? And then um, additionally, if, has any of those given you pause? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, as we just said, I think the preprint servers are great. I'm, I'm a real fan of them. I think the, um, the, the sooner that you can share, um, you know, science, scientific progress, the better. And, um, I think actually the current system works pretty well. There's been a lot of discussion about journals and whether they really have a role anymore, but I, I really like the combination of the, the preprint server for getting in for sharing information very quickly and the, um, journals and, reviewing process for sort of, you know, improve papers almost always get improved when they go through the review process. And then there's some filtering too, like, a, you know, if, if you're sort of an armchair scientist at home or, you know, amateur and you want to, you get some issue of some, some journal, you can sort of get a, get a sort of sampling of stuff that's happened. And it's, it's sort of, they, they deal with the filtering process. Um, it's of course, highly imperfect. Um, I think what gives me pause most is um, I mean, we've seen in the last four years how, you know, uh, how Twitter can be used, um, you know, to to um, uh, in in ways that are just simply having social media and whoever as the most, um, you know, whatever concerted or aggressive, uh, you know, pr promotional campaign uh, being this being the science that gets to the general public. I I think is 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 a little bit dangerous because. I'm not sure there's much of a correlation between how proficient people are at using and manipulating social media and how good how good scientists they are. And so, um, so I think that that's I think that's that's the caution. Um, uh, and I don't really know. I mean, it could, you could just say that everyone has to learn how to use Twitter effectively, um, or yeah, I don't know. So I think that's the only caution. Uh, Dr. Tarani, I'd love to bring you into this um, this discussion, especially given some of your background in looking at public reaction to stem cell hype. So I was hoping you could kind of just give uh, a brief summary of some of the work you've done 
in the past looking at kind of that public reaction to uh, really exciting new scientific discoveries that have a lot of promises um, and then what's kind of happened since then? Sure. So um, I think there are a number of lessons that we can learn from past biotechnologies, um, so such as stem cells, um, and the way that the research was initially portrayed to the general public. So um, early on, stem cells were very controversial, right? Because human embryonic stem cells came from um, human embryos, um, and it involved the derivation of the cells involved the destruction of, of human embryos. So um, I think that. Um, because of the controversy surrounding um, that technology, there was sort of this sense of need by scientists to court the general public and sort of sway public in, um, in order to attract funding. Um, and I think in that process, there were some over promises made that were you know, not scientifically realistic, um, such as like, oh, within five to 10 years, we're gonna you know, have all of these diseases cured. And obviously that never happened 20 years later. Um, because of all of the technical challenges that came along that you know, were unforeseen at that time. So I think the lesson um, that we can learn from that is that um, it's, while it's important to convey um, scientific discoveries in an accessible way to the general public, I think also scientists and journalists can um, play an important role um, in the way that technology is perceived by tempering that excitement and enthusiasm for the discovery with also, um, you know, with some balance by addressing the challenges that are involved in translating basic research to the clinic, um, to therapy, um, addressing the risks that are involved, addressing the, the need that this basic has to be tested further in order to be safe and effective before we be able for. Uh, um, so I think that um, to apply that here with designer proteins, I just hope that um, moving forward, that scientists, you know, journalists will will not only explain the science, but also make sure the public understands that this process of you know therapy translation is long and it requires patience, um, and um, you know it could take years. And if it's not communicated effectively, not only could it um, harm the public, but it could also hurt science because you know people can start to mistrust the scientific process. Okay, yeah, very interesting. I have a lot of thoughts bouncing around in my head right now between um, you know, this caution of uh, the difference between really well done scientific research and then uh, social media promotion that Dr. Baker brought up, um, this onus on the individuals um, to kind of sort through information and misinformation that uh, Dr. Matu brought up. Um, and then these questions about kind of not overhyping uh, scientific discoveries. And I think we're living through a pretty big example of that right now with um, how the vaccines are being uh, kind of marketed and advertised in terms of how much people's behavior can change once they are vaccinated. And um, I know literally a couple hours ago, we have new CDC recommendations talking about um, that vaccinated people after being fully immunized can hang out um, indoors. And that is now official CDC recommendation. Um, so. Again, given all of these really complicated um, parties and uh, responsibilities, I'm wondering, um, Dr. Matu or Dr. Baker or Dr. Tarani, if any of you want to jump in, um, which is kind of, what, what, how are you thinking about um, these different things, about the different roles and responsibilities, how these different forces of um, who sorts out what uh, misinformation? And then um, this can kind of tie into Another audience question we have, which is, uh, can you think of ways to combat the mistrust of scientists in academia? Um, when we have uh, social media promotion, when we have uh, a history of potential overhypement of new technologies, um, how do we build back that trust and how, do, how does the scientific community get people to be able to sort through the information and the misinformation? Um, so I don't, Dr. Matu, uh, can we start with you and we'll, we'll go around? Sure. Um, well, so Lots of points over there, but um, so for, for one thing, um, you know what uh, Dr. Baker addressed that um, you can maybe the loudest voice is the one that knows how to manipulate social media. Um, but there is a counter side to that, and in that, you know, so for instance, I'm a recent um, uh, addition to Twitter, 
but my my involvement with Twitter is mainly in the science Twitter. And over there, um, yes, there there is self promotion, but then um, science in general is self correcting. It's self policing. And so, if there is some degree of hype, and especially at the rate at which uh, information is being transmitted right now, if there is some hype or there is some information that's incorrect, um, the scientific community itself will capture it and will be able to present the counter views. So, um, so there is a bit of a balance over there that um, hype won't necessarily take take over for too long, especially as we make that effort to be communicating um, the information. And then this is, again, where, where we come back to, like, how do you make sure misinformation doesn't take over um, unless we make that effort of communicating the correct information. And that, that means not just like one person alone, but David Baker's doing fantastic stuff. He's not gonna be the only one talking about it. Uh, several of us scientists will then go talk about it and stand behind and endorse his research. Um, likewise, if somebody is doing something that is potentially not correct, not as many of the scientists will put their stamp of approval on it. And I think that's one way for the for the community to really gauge what is what is real and what is not. Dr. Baker, any um... Do you want to respond to anything or, or address that question of this idea of combating mistrust of scientists in academia? Well, I think there were a couple of really point, good points that were made. Um, the, the one about um, scientists while popularizing what they're doing, not overstating because, and that, because of the negative effect that can have both on misleading the public and on um, the future of the science. And that's a very fine line, right? Because to get, it's, it's, sort, of, it's sort of the flip side of trying to um, disseminate, you know, if you're trying to explain to the public why they should, why some breakthrough is interesting or why they should care, then the potential impact is really what most people want to know about. So I think the, the very delicate thing is how do you convey potential impact without, in, with, 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 um, but qualifying it in a way so it's not misleading. Um, and then I think as far as the self-correcting nature of um, social media, I mean, I think that would be great. Uh, um, you know, it was just suggested to um, uh, the idea that that uh, somewhat scientists will 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 um, describe something they've done, and then other scientists will say that's great or that's not so great. So I think that that could be a really good mechanism, and maybe some way of of organizing this. Um, uh, and I think this is something that's been thought of with regard to preprint servers, but. Maybe it could be, you know, on Twitter or whatever. So right now, when um, I don't have a Twitter account myself, but my wife, everyone, so I will show me a, some Twitter feed on a paper that we put out. So, um, so I think that if there was maybe an organized way of, of, of I mean, it have, certainly happens with um, with preprints. So after on um, preprint servers, people will comment. So, yeah. So I think that kind of scheme could work. So I think I think those are both really important points. And Dr. Tarani, uh, would you like to respond to any of that? Or again, addressing that question of mistrust. Um, if we had science Twitter, do you think we would have been, wouldn't have gone through the same uh, uh, hype cycle around stem cell therapy 10, 15 years ago? I don't know. Maybe it would have been even worse with the way things go viral. Um, I think at that time, the problem was that, um, you know, these, these journal, you know, stem cells essentially became like, popular culture, like People Magazine and the Daily Mail were writing articles on stem cells and journalists were not sort of verifying um, the implications of the discoveries with third parties. And so, um, you know, they were just making these extrapolations based on of like animal studies and in vitro studies. And I just think, um, yeah, I just think that, you know, Twitter is great, um, but one of the downsides is, is that uh, there's only like so much you can write in a tweet. And so if you want to like bring up these sort of um, red flags that, hey, this is just, you know, an in vitro study or just an animal study, we can't extrapolate this to humans just yet. It might, sometimes it's just a little bit difficult to do that on social media. But um, yeah, I don't know, maybe it would have been better. I don't know if it would have been better or worse, but um, it, um, it's definitely having some effect now in some positive ways with, with uh, the vaccines. 
All right, and Dr. Matu, uh, back to you. Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, the the importance of uh, or the general theme that comes out of this is really uh, proper science communication. So, you know, what uh, um, Dr. Tarani was talking about, you know, with People Magazine taking over and uh, pushing the hype, we're talking about somebody who's not a scientist now presenting that work without communicating with the with a scientific expert. Um, but in the past year, for instance, I, I, I'll point to the New York Times. The New York Times has done a really, really good job of presenting um, some of the, the science behind, say, the COVID vaccine or just, just COVID in general. And that's in large part because there's been really good communication between a real a scientific scientist and expert and the um, the journalist and i think that's the kind of collaboration that kind of um, science communication is so critical um, and that again feeds into our scientific community for the longest time when we got trained for science the idea was oh you're getting trained to continue to do research um, and so you would just then become another scientist or another academic. At some point you started going into industry, but over time we've, we've realized that, okay, just going into academia or going into industry are not the only options after you get a PhD. You can go into science writing, you can go into communication, you can go into policy. And as more and more scientists get diversify and get into these other fields, that's one way for us to bring that community, um, to be able to speak to the community better and get the community more engaged with what we're doing. I, I um, just wanted to, sorry about jumping in, but um, uh, no, absolutely. I, think, um, I, I don't know whether you planned it this way, but this is a really fundamental debate. And by having Dr. Charani and Dr. Matu here, you have the two opposite sides in this debate about sort of the fundamentally optimistic view that um, that social media can can and that, that there is a self-correcting aspect to it and the one and, and the less optimistic one that, you know, it really probably needs to be more regulated and there's some serious problems that need to be addressed. And I guess I probably come out somewhere in the middle. But one thing that, um, just to follow up on the comments just now, one thing that perhaps the, the federal government should consider is some sort of federal support for science writers. Like, you know, newspapers, as we all know, are having their staff cuts. They, they, they can't keep going. And, you know, the New York Times can keep a good science uh, division, but um, but most newspapers are having to slash and cut, and um, uh, so so maybe that's something that the government should should consider, or maybe it does already. And you know, something that NIH could recognize that com good communication is important, and you know, have pay for people at newspapers or other news outlets to really go into deep deep on that. Maybe that would be useful. I don't know. Well, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute is doing a pretty good job with with science communication through the through the iBiology lecture series and all. And so, um, you know, as this is an example of the, the scientific institutes themselves investing in, in, a, uh, in a more systematic form of communication. And I think more of us should, uh, should do that. Well, I think uh, kind of naming the two sides of a perpetually ongoing debate um, and then calling for dramatic government action is a, a great point to uh, call it a day here. Um, so uh, I think we're going to have to stop. Um, I want to have our panelists have the final word. Um, so I'm going to do some thank yous and give some announcements. But um, I have one last question for everyone. Um, so I'm a strong believer that any event like this isn't just about uh, hosting and featuring conversations, but starting new ones. Um, so I'd love to hear from each of you kind of uh, one idea that really came up that you found really intriguing during our conversation today or, or one question that you're gonna have going forward. Um, so I'm gonna get to all of you in a second, uh, but while I let them think, uh, I hope that everyone can join me in thanking Dr. Seema Matu, Assistant Professor in the Department of Biological Sciences, Dr. Shamila Jana Karim, uh, Visiting Faculty in the Learning Design and Technology Program, Taryn Coyle, a Senior in Microbiology in the Honors College, Dr. Zara Tirani, a clinical assistant professor in the Honors College, and our honored guest, Dr. David Baker, the Henrietta and Aubrey Davis Endowed Professor in Biochemistry at the University of Washington. Thank you once again to the Honors College for sponsoring today's event and towards uh, my grandfather, Dr. Arthur Aronson, for sponsoring the lecture series. Please join us again uh, tomorrow, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time for Dr. Baker's keynote, 
Um, and thank you for attendance and your attention. All right, now to our panelists. Uh, your takeaway thought or question from today's discussion. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Matu. Well, I think the one, one point that just jumps out was um, how important collaborative research is. Uh, Dr. Baker addressed this right in the beginning, and we've seen it in just in this past year during the pandemic, that 17 years worth of work um, uh, on, the, on the vaccine, and then with tons and tons of collaboration and open communication, we were quickly able to convert it into an actual um, vaccine. And so that's my take home that um, how, how do we make, make our science more open uh, without penalizing it? Um, and what can we do to foster um, such collaboration where it's where you're actually valued for doing that type of collaboration, where the funding sources will also promote such collaboration. All right, and Shamila? Yeah, first of all, I have to thank Dr. Baker and our wonderful panelists. I really learned a lot about proteins and uh, folded the game folded. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been so much in touch with uh, science and I've been in the education field for uh, some time now. So my takeaway is that uh, I stay with my games. So games are wonderful ways to um, communicate scientific uh, discoveries. And when we are going to teach uh, students, if we have games, we can make them realize that no topic is difficult to learn. So since games can attract, engage, and motivate learners, so that's one wonderful way instead of giving them a straight lecture. If we let them play a game, they'll get interested in the topic. So that way, I think games are very useful in communicating scientific research to our uh, learning community. That's what I think. Fantastic. And Taryn? Sorry, had to unmute myself there. Um, I think the most interesting takeaway I've gotten from this um, has been touching on the collaboration uh, aspect that Dr. Matu was talking about. Um, I think just the fact that there are so many different avenues to communicating uh, scientific research or communicating science in general, like for example, Fold It and Games, um, I think that's a really cool avenue that um, could really be explored more and I'd be really interested in exploring more. Great, and Dr. Tarani? Well, I think Foldit has inspired me um, pedagogically into this whole new area of learning, um, using gaming as a learning tool. And so I think after listening to the discussion today, in particular, Shamila, how you talked about the critical components of what a game needs to be, a, um, you know, to be effective as a learning tool. I think I'm leaving with the question of how do I, you know, um, what are the best practices for using um, this game um, to teach students? So I think that's what I'm going to be, you know, focusing on leaving here today is um, learning those best practices. Great, and Dr. Baker. Uh, well, I, I think this whole question about how scientists um, communicate to the general public and how social media and and other and preprints and games can all combine with that, I think is a really important question. And uh, yeah, and thanks for holding this panel. It was great. And uh, I look forward to the rest of the of the events uh, supported by your grandfather. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. And to our audience, thank you. And uh, we will be back tomorrow.